On this episode of Latinas, we celebrate Puerto Rican Heritage Month. We'll meet Boricua author Karina Nicole Gonzalez, discuss relationships in the trans community, talk politics, and so much more. Latinas starts now. Welcome to Latinas, the show that celebrates Nuestra Mujeres in the Latinx community. I'm Tina Beth Pina. Today, I'm at Barrio BX, a Puerto Rican restaurant in the Bronx serving up all kinds of delicious food from pastelillos to mofongo. It's the perfect location to celebrate Puerto Rican Heritage Month, an annual commemoration that's been taking place in New York since the late 1980s. On the other hand, CUNY Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College in New York City also known as Centro, celebrates the Puerto Rican diaspora all year long. It's the largest university-based research institute, library, and archive dedicated to the Puerto Rican experience in the United States. Let's take a look and see what this 50-year-old center is all about. The Center for Puerto Rican Studies is the largest university-based research institute devoted to the study and preservation of the Puerto Rican experience. But Centro is so much more. We're a library, an archive, a think tank, a press, and a dynamic media production team. For the last 50 years, it's been really important for the community to have a library and archive. The general public can come. You don't have to show any credential or anything like that. Just having an interest in our collection is enough and you don't necessarily have to be at Centro to benefit from the materials from our library and archives. The archives has done a phenomenal job adjusting to the digital age. We have a standalone digital platform that has over 25,000 records that you can access from anywhere in the world. So we're the only U.S.-based research institute devoted to the interdisciplinary study of Puerto Ricans. We look into the socioeconomic, demographics, or migration of Puerto Ricans in the U.S. So the advantage of having digital data is so that the community at large can have it readily accessible. They're able to download the data or view it on their computers, tablets, or you know, phones. One of the new initiatives here at Centro is the Arts and Culture Department. We believe that we need to put a face to the numbers and the history of our people. Our journal, which is the leading peer-reviewed journal in Puerto Rican studies in the U.S., have never been afraid of pushing boundaries. We need to acknowledge the contributions of our artists, our writers, and our poets. As we gear up for our 50th anniversary, we're involved in a process of introspection. We're proud to celebrate our roots as a product of collective activism and to reflect on the legacy of our community. Looking proudly at our past, visiting and reimagining ourselves as we move forward. So I hope you will visit us, explore our collections, participate in our events, and join us in reimagining the Puerto Rican future together. It's November, election month across the United States, and Latinos are rapidly becoming the fastest growing racial and ethnic group in the nation. Naturally, our influence on American politics is becoming greater with each election cycle. Latina voters, like myself, have become a force to be reckoned with. And correspondent Marlene Peralta takes a look at our political influence in this month's Prospecto Latina. 100 years after women were given the right to vote, they are exercising that right even more than men. This pattern cuts across all races and ethnicities, including Latinas. In fact, the Latina vote is the fastest growing segment of the Latinx electorate. I think that for Latinas, there really has been an effort over the years to really engage Latinas into the political process. I would say everything from media to our community organizations. And, you know, it wouldn't be a coincidence, the fact that in a lot of our organizations, you know, you have Latinas at the forefront talking about the issues that are impacting us 
every single day. Latinas are in fact very well represented in the efforts to mobilize voters, not just leading organizations and running for office, but also behind the scenes. We met two of them. I'm the Senior Director of Empowerment at RISE. RISE is a national nonprofit that uses sports as a vehicle to promote social justice issues and better race relations. We believe that sports is the ultimate unifier, equalizer, if you will. And no matter who you are, you can sit at a bar, you know, root for the Yankees or the Boston Red Sox, um, you know, indifferent of your political views, your views on race, and spark a conversation. La Boricua Yasmin Sanchez, on the other hand, has been an advocate for her community for years. Motivated by the poor living conditions in the public housing projects she grew up in. We're leaders in our community by right, head of households, um, presidents of the resident association and the parent association. So these are things that are innate in us. Um, and we have to mobilize around that and gain some traction around that. We already know this, we run for these positions because we see the injustices in our communities and how the government and the systems and the structures are treating our communities, ourselves, and we are fighting against that, right? And what better way than to mobilize voting blocks? According to a CUNY study, in 2020, the Latina voter turnout was higher than that of Latino men in nearly every state with reliable estimates. That same year, Latino voting reached an all-time high with approximately 16 and a half million Latinos voting. Despite the dramatic improvements, Latino voting in general lagged behind other people of color, including African Americans and even Asian voters. In fact, in the election of 2020, the Latino voter turnout was the lowest among all groups. The Latinas we spoke with still see hope. In New York City, we have a majority of women on the New York City Council with 31 women on the council, 10 of which are Latina. And most recently, we had two women run for lieutenant governor, which has never occurred in the history of New York State. We believe that working with athletes and these specific um, stakeholders will actually reach more people because who doesn't love sports? Who isn't a sports fan? So that puts them in a unique position to lead in these communities. So why not le leverage uh, that to get them the tools that they need in order to be successful and, and advocate for themselves? Also, changing the, the landscape, right? Like we're telling our personal stories. Why is this important to us? And before that didn't have a space on any platform. We need to in, be involved in every single aspect of policy and organizing because it affects us intimately. Every second of the day is political. Experts hope that the voting trend among Latinos will continue to increase, especially since it is expected that Latinas will become the largest voting force by 2050. For Latinas, I am Marlene Peralta. Nowadays, relationships are as complex as ever, no matter who you are. In our final Caliente Caliente on being trans, Dadrian, Danny, and Julian are back to share their views and experiences on finding love as trans men. Okay, so we're both single, so yeah, yeah, I'm you single. gotta come from a different perspective for us because we don't know how it is. I, I think it was easier for me because I didn't medically transition mm. and I'm only into men. And so a lot of men kind of just saw me as a tomboy. Mm. Uh, mm. And I went out with a lot of straight guys mm. and it honestly didn't really work out because I knew that down the line, I'm like, you know, in the future, I, I can't be with somebody like that because if I want to medically transition they're not gonna be there it. for that mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and so I stayed single for a long time I was single for like six years and honestly was comfortable with the idea of being single and then my current partner Sam kind of just came into my life and uh, honestly it worked out really well because he's not like fully straight so and he's 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 very comfortable with just the personality of somebody instead of how they look mm -hmm. and that helped me a lot and that's actually a big reason as to why I decided it was okay for me to go on testosterone because he was so supportive of it and I feel like that's what I needed to get me started well to talk about I would 
I don't want to put it on blast. But what do you mean? I think that's the whole point. <laughs> I have a yeah. Story. I have like a person, right? Um, and I've always been with straight women. I'm into anything. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of my challenges with being with this person is, um, they're in a religious family, right? Mm -hmm. And my thing is like, do I come out, or am I keeping, or am, or am I keeping this to myself, right? Mm -hmm. Like. Um, do I have to come out again or do I keep this to myself? So what are the challenges? Because I'm not taking, like, once I take that person serious, like, those are questions that I don't know because I've never been in a situation like that prior to medically transitioning. You know, mm -hmm. I pass 100%, yeah. you know, I know that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I go out to, like, a bar and, long story short, I was dancing with a guy and, you know, I felt like he was into me and then I, like, I was like, I'm transgender and walked away like and he <laughs> like laughed and he was like it's okay and then yeah. I felt like I had to because I don't know or yeah, like with women yeah I mean in in situations like that that makes sense yeah um especially if you are liking somebody like it's good to tell them beforehand yeah if you one for safety yeah one for safety because you don't yeah. know how who, who they are and how, they gonna how they're react. gonna react to that mm -hmm. uh it's like it, it's honestly more safety and also that way you can find your crowd and like know who you're with right now i'm single but i think eventually once i start dating i always put it in my mind that whoever i do date they're gonna have to be a part of the lgbt community because i feel like they're gonna have to understand that i am transgender and not everybody even medically transitions so mm -hmm. not everyone has top surgery not everybody yeah. has bottom surgery yep. you know you instantly think like are you gonna get the big surgery like everyone yeah. wants to know if you're gonna have a penis or whatever yeah. and i'm just like not everybody Not everybody friends. wants that. And those no. things are private. That's something yep. I'm still deciding for myself. Like for other people to just automatically assume, mm -hmm. I'm like, no. First like, of all, it's like, <laughs> why do you need to know? Why do you need to know? <laughs> the person that I'm dating needs yeah, to know. Exactly. But everybody else, honestly, they can just mind their business. Yeah. <laughs> no, just true, that's true, that's true. Dr. Evelina Antonetti was one of the most important figures of the Puerto Rican diaspora in the United States. Known as the mother of the Bronx, Antonetti was an activist who in 1965 founded United Bronx Parents, also known as UBP, an organization that fostered quality education and community control of schools. By the 1970s, UBP became a model of urban grassroots organizing and expanded to include a bilingual care center, an adult education program, Program and a youth leadership center. It empowered residents to fight against the social ills caused by failed urban and economic policies. Although Evelina passed away in 1984 at only 62 years old, her legacy lives on in the work of United Bronx Parents, which has since expanded to other cities within New York and throughout the country. The countless young men and women she helped nurture along the way will forever be grateful to her dedication to them and to their community. Dr. Evelina Antonetti is today's Badass Latina. The CUNY wheelchair basketball team is the first of its kind on the eastern seaboard. And one of its star players, Boricua Sierra Larauri Garcia, is the first CUNY student athlete to ever be invited to a Team USA tryout in any sport. So let's see what she and this program are all about. My name is Sierra Larauri. Uh, I'm from Puerto Rico. 25 years old. I play wheelchair basketball for CUNY team. Our program is really unique in the sense that it serves all our individual campuses. With this program, one of the things that I really love what it does is I think it takes all of our students with disabilities and gives them a way to be represented within the university and provides them the same opportunities as their peers, right? You know, I think there is a uniqueness within the adaptive sports community because the opportunity is so few and far between. But at the end of the day, sport is sport, right? I play able body basketball for basically all my life. I did that until 2014 when I was done, basically, because I knew my hip condition wasn't going to allow me to go any further. So my hip condition is called leg calf pertis disease. Basically what happened when I was seven years old, my joint ball didn't got enough oxygen, so it disappeared completely. So I could be walking anywhere and just boop, my hip would come out. So standing basketball, I played all the way from elementary school to high school. I was in La Lorenzo Vizcarrondo back in Puerto Rico. That was my high school. 
And we actually got like municipal championship all three years. So I, after that, I was like, you know what, that's it. I'll end on a good note, that's fine. I don't need to do this anymore. I'm not gonna go to college and do this because I'm gonna get hurt. But then my mom, throughout this ent entire process of me saying I'm gonna play able-bodied basketball, she was like, there is sitting basketball. Like, just don't be so stubborn. Sit down. I was like, I'm not gonna sit down yet. I'm not gonna sit down yet. 2014 came by. I was ready to just stop playing. And then that same summer, we saw the Puerto Rico Federation of wheelchair basketball. And then my mom saw them and she was like, we're doing this. And so two weeks after, I went to my first practice. I fell backwards. I was like, boom. I was like, yes, I love it. Let's go. She's just got, aside from, you know, the skill set she has as an athlete, you know, ability to score the basketball, she's just the kind of person that you could see teammates really working well with, and she's kind of like a campfire. Everybody wants to get close to Sierra, right? Because, you know, her personality and just, just such a great person. When I started playing for Coach Ryan, it was more like, okay, professional status. It's like, we go to practices, we do this, we do that. And it was like an entire regimen that I wasn't used to it necessarily, but it, it kind of made it better and it made the difference, if you ask me. That's, that's it, that's the point where everything kind of started changing. I was selected to go to the USA Paralympic tryouts for the USA team. It was amazing, it was an amazing opportunity. It was filled with a lot of knowledge and, and learning experiences. I didn't got selected, but I kind of knew that was gonna happen because I'm pretty new at this level. So yes, I've been playing wheelchair basketball for a long time, but not at this level. So just getting there with just a year and a half of experience was pretty big. I think she's just scratching the surface of the type of basketball she can, uh, basketball player she can be. And I think she's just starting to learn to hone her leadership style. So I, I've enjoyed watching her journey as a basketball player and even as a person thus far. And, I, and I'm glad we have some more time with her before she graduates. According to the CDC, Latinos have a more than 50% chance of developing type 2 diabetes, and you're likely to develop it at a younger age. Dr. Stephanie Martinez from Union Community Health Center is about to tell us what we can do to help prevent or delay the onset of diabetes in today's Medical Minute. Type 2 diabetes is when the body doesn't produce enough insulin or can't use the insulin well, which will lead to an increased blood sugar in the bloodstream. People with type 2 diabetes are said to have insulin resistance and may also develop other complications associated with diabetes, such as heart disease, chronic kidney disease, and problems with the feet, just to name a few. Since Latinos are 50% more likely to develop type 2 diabetes, they have a higher rate of kidney failure caused by it. Some of the common symptoms people may have, but don't really notice in the beginning, include being very thirsty, urinating a lot, blurry vision, tingling or numbness of your hands and feet, fatigue, and weight loss without even trying. You should also check if you have dark rashes under your neck or your underarms, and if you do, you should definitely see your doctor. These rashes are called acanthosis nigricans, and they are signs that your body is becoming resistant to insulin. It's important to note that with type 2 diabetes and prediabetes, lifestyle changes can be made to help prevent or delay their onset, and some diabetes can even be managed with the proper support and care. Some ways to manage diabetes include increasing your physical activity, which makes the body more sensitive to insulin and helps manage the diabetes, creating a dietary plan with a dietitian to eat foods that help keep blood sugar within a target range, and monitoring your blood sugar levels. These lifestyle changes, along with a non-insulin medication, will help you manage type 2 diabetes. For Latinas, I'm Dr. Stephanie Martinez. Hurricanes Fiona and Ian recently created havoc across the Caribbean, and especially on the island of Puerto Rico. With hurricane season well underway, correspondent Elena Romero sat down with Boricua author Karina Nicole Gonzalez to discuss how her book, The Coquillas Still Sing, can help children cope with natural disasters. 
we do experience terrible things in our lifetimes, but there are always going to be moments of hope and moments where you can say, I resist. Karina Nicole Gonzalez, a bilingual speech language pathologist, is the author of The Coquillas Still Sing. Her debut picture book is about a family surviving Hurricane Maria and how the characters mirror the resilience and strength of the Puerto Rican people. So the abuela is definitely inspired by my abuela and Elena is inspired by every child in Puerto Rico and every child who's experienced a climate disaster. There's a scene in the book in which we see her crying and I feel we rarely see children cry in books and the fact that Crystal actually visually depicted that scene of Elena crying was so moving and I wanted to write a story that children felt was real and authentic. A Brooklyn College alum, Gonzalez intentionally used the coqui and its unique sounds as a symbol throughout her book. The coqui is the emblematic sound of Puerto Rico. It's uh, like a lullaby at night. There's something there that we perhaps as a people identify with the resiliency of, of our coqui frog. Of Yes, it's experiencing a population decline, Yes, you know, their habitat, you know, they're experiencing incursions in their habitat, and yet they manage to survive and um, sing at night. Women are also central figures to her book. My mother worked up to six jobs at one point during my childhood. I want to write stories that center moms, you know, and, or parents or grandparents and all the sacrifices that they give up so that children can be happy and um, make it in this really tough world. In addition to the fictional tale, The Coquillas Still Sing provides readers with historical information and a list of resources for those wanting to learn more about the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. My book touches on what it means to write a story that is grounded or cultivates a love for humanity and the environment within one story. It's um, an example of how we're intertwined, how we can't separate nature from humanity, that we're connected. What do you hope to accomplish with your book? You know, just seeing this little girl on the front cover, I mean, I would have loved to have seen that as a kid. And now we see more children of color in books, and I'm so happy about that. So. What makes my story unique is that it's a story about Puerto Rico and unfortunately there still aren't that many stories about Puerto Rico. And I hope that people, you know, welcome this story into their world and share it with others. For Latinas, I'm Elena Romero. Succeeding in the culinary world in New York City as a female chef is no easy task. But Maria Martinez has made her gastronomic ascent look effortless. And that's why she's today's Latina on the Rise. I'm very proud of the Puerto Rican, yeah. And then also being a woman working in, as a head chef here in New York is, is a big deal. I'm super proud of this, this, this opportunity. It's amazing. Maria Martinez is the head chef at Chocobar Cortez, a Caribbean chocolate restaurant in the Bronx. It's the first franchise open outside of Puerto Rico. When I see the, that it's going to be Choco, Chocobar Cortez, and I already visited the place in Puerto Rico, I was like, I really want that job. In, in that moment, I have other opportunities, but I was really waiting for have the opportunity here so I can show the flavor of Puerto Rican food. It never had the, really the taste of my grandmother or something like that. So that's what I want to bring here. So far, so mm-mm good. Some of the most popular items on the menu include the chocolate grilled cheese, mofongo, the choco burger, and more. I'm doing the, the menu that we have in Puerto Rico, but they allow me also to add like new stuff, like my soups, and or have ideas that it can add more Puerto Rican flavor. Every time that I have to make something new, I start thinking of what I'm eating as a, as a kid and how I learned how to cook, like how my mother cooked. And when I bring all these flavors, people really like, like, oh, this is remind me to Puerto Rico. So that's what I'm focusing on right now. Ironically, the Puerto Rican mom of three didn't plan on becoming a chef after graduating from school. When I graduated to culinary school, I was like already like 
all, so it was like I didn't go after college. So it's something that I decide after I have my three kids. So I was very focused on, on the school. We used to talk about New York in the culinary school in Puerto Rico. Like it's a big place to work, but a, big, a lot of opportunities here. And then I, I made it happen. In her 10 years in New York City, Maria's delicious creations have delighted the taste buds of diners at Mesa Grill, Cafe Guia, and now Choco Bar Cortez. She offers the following advice for up and coming Latina chefs who also want to have a successful culinary career. It's hard because we are Latina and we are women. We all know it's not a secret, it's, it's hard. It's gonna be hard. So be sure of you and do it because if you are like humble, these people are gonna have your back and we're all gonna be a family. As long as you stay humble, that's, that's the key of being a head chef. And that's our show for today. For more information on what you just saw, check out our website at tv.cuny.edu and follow our social media profiles. We love sharing our Latina stories with you. And please make sure you tune in next month where we'll celebrate the holiday season and so much more. Uepa! Keep enjoying Puerto Rican Heritage Month. Y hasta la próxima. Bye-bye.